Hello, Adam's children. Please take a seat and hear the words that Adam commands I speak. I have done several videos on the weapons of Fallout, and as we exhaust all the weapons in the series, we inevitably come to weapons that were not featured in past videos because of their trickiness in classification. They either don't fit into any category, straddle a few categories, or just didn't fit into how I structured my videos where I focused on the different types like pistols, rifles, shotguns, and even laser, plasma, etc. So we are mentioning them now in this grab bag of a video. After the list, I have my comment highlights and see if I react to your comment on a previous video. So turn up the rads and get the fancy lads as we talk about the misfit weapons of Fallout. Although the concept of homemade weapons is not new to the series, the fairly unpopular pipe weapons that were introduced in Fallout 4 have not been covered before in any of my videos because they can be modified to be a pistol, rifle, or something in between, and so they defied my classification schemes. In fact, pipe weapons are the most dynamic of all weapon systems in Fallout 4, and the majority of the weapon upgrades are available early on with minimal perk investment. Pipe weapons in Fallout 4 are most often chambered in 38 caliber, some in the more powerful 45, or even 308 and the insanely large 50 caliber rounds. I would be very hesitant to fire any homemade gun, and a thousand times more hesitant to fire a homemade gun shooting 308 or 50 cal. It is interesting to note that 38 caliber ammo is very common to find in the Commonwealth, yet the only weapon that can shoot 38 caliber is the homemade pipe weaponry, or technically the combat rifle can, with the 38 caliber receiver mod, but that is not a common sight in the wasteland. The weapon mods quite drastically change the look of the pipe weapons, therefore there is no real uniform look among them. They are all, unsurprisingly, clearly not made in a controlled industrial manner. Since the mods change the look of the weapon quite drastically, I wanted to look at the aesthetics of the different weapons and mods. Bolts and nuts are very common. The trigger is more often than not just one bolt. The scopes will have small bolts protruding out of them, and even some of the stocks will have large nuts right on the butt of the stock. That would be outrageously uncomfortable while shooting. All receivers look the same no matter what the modification is, with the revolvers of course sporting a rotating cylinder, and the bolt action and normal semi-auto receivers otherwise looking the same. The action is right above the magazine, as it should be. But right above the trigger is another slot with a protruding bolt that looks a lot like another action, and the in-game files tell us that this is the hammer. Back to the plethora of mods, the barrels come in many flavors, everything from just a normal pipe to what looks like a heat-treated pipe, and even very bulky options like the so-called long barrel that may just be adding extra weight to the front to help with barrel control and even a finned barrel option that has a bunch of fins welded to the barrel, likely to help dissipate heat. Stocks can be fitted, everything from a simple pipe construction to designs with springs that are likely supposed to help absorb some of the recoil. The reflex sights are a tube with screws on either side that are close enough together that you just put the target between the two points. There's even a glowing version where the screw tips will glow with Adam's blessing. The weapon magazines by all other comparisons are pretty tame, but the drum magazine has additional hardware to support the bulk, and the magazine itself is very obviously handmade. Muzzle mods include a very sketchy looking jagged piece of metal, a combat knife, some tame options like a muzzle breaker compensator, and my personal favorite, the homemade suppressor. This suppressor is a repurposed oil filter that has been drilled and fitted to the end of the barrel and that is honestly just a superb touch. Many versions use a large bolt for a trigger, a discolored and concerningly not straight pipe barrel, and the forestock, which is made of a very rough piece of wood, is fastened to the barrel with a bunch of wire. Almost every part of these weapons looks like an ergonomic nightmare, from the stocks with large nuts or bolts sticking out, which would just jab into your arm with every shot, to the sharp metal edges on a lot of the pistol grips. It is obvious these were made cheaply with what materials were available, 
but really these look almost as dangerous to the user as they would be to any potential enemy. Fallout 76 took pipe weapons that already had an absurd number of mods and gave us even more. Where Fallout 4 had 52, Fallout 76 has 67, giving extra receiver, stock, and barrel options. The rate of fire can be changed to your liking, and they can even be made to shoot ultra sight ammo, helping with the damage output. Pipe weapons can only be chambered in 38 and 45 now. No larger rounds like the 308 or 50 caliber, which is probably for the best. An interesting note is that some different designs in the concept art show named configurations like Big John, Handbreaker, or Tusk, among many others. This seems to indicate that there were standardized versions, which could hint towards there being at least some organized effort to produce these weapons. A pipe revolver features prominently on an issue of Guns and Bullets, where the magazine features an article about the street guns of Detroit. This would imply that pipe weaponry is fairly widespread and not just isolated to the Commonwealth or Appalachia where we have seen them in game. So an interesting question then is how much of the pipe weaponry we see now was made post-war as people desperately made weapons to defend themselves and how much was being made pre-war? I don't know if there's any way to know for sure, but the presence of such weapons in the pre-war suggests that it was easier or more profitable to make janky homemade guns than to buy a conventional firearm. This could be because gun prices were just too high given the war and economic issues of the pre-war, or it could mean that there was heavy regulation that motivated people to create these weapons, especially ones that couldn't be traced. Additionally, it is possible that some areas outright banned the personal ownership of firearms. Although the high number of skeletons with or surrounded by weapons seems to indicate that firearms were still widespread among the American population. One of the few entries on this list from Fallout 2 is the Plant Spike, a weapon so pathetic that the game decided to make it weightless so that there was no penalty for having it in your inventory. Unfortunately, it has no value to anyone, so it's not an easy get rich quick scheme. The spike is an organic seed spike that plants can shoot at enemies from a distance and are most often first encountered in Arroyo at the beginning of Fallout 2. They do very little damage, only 1-2 to two base, and can only be thrown by the player if they are picked up off the ground and equipped. I actually did not realize these could be picked up and equipped until I did research for this video. That's how inconsequential these weapons really are. Speaking of nearly worthless things, and no, I'm not talking about my attempts at humor, Fallout Tactics has the dart, which looks like a homemade version of a common throwing dart. It can be thrown or thrust for damage, but the base damage range is only 3 to 6, making it a very questionable choice for fighting. This is especially true because by the time that you get to the point in the game where people will have these in their inventory, you'll have plenty of other throwing weapon options that are very clearly superior in range and damage. Being equipped by some civilians at Macomb, you know the weapon is underwhelming when the in-game description just says this. It's a dart. It could get under the skin and cause a nasty infection. You know what else could cause a nasty infection? Just living and breathing in post-war America. It's a frickin' wasteland for Adam's sake. The dart is a nice segue to the dart gun of Fallout 3, which is one of the few craftable weapons in the game. Darts in Fallout 3 can only be used as ammunition and can't be thrown or used in a melee attack like in Tactics. And the darts are very clearly hobby darts, made obvious by the box they come in and the in-game model. Only available in Fallout 3, the dart gun requires the schematics to the weapon before it can be crafted, and it is made with the following materials, a paint gun, a toy car, surgical tubing, and a rad scorpion gland. While it is quite simple in construction, with the paint gun comprising most of the weapon, the car, and more specifically the wheels of the toy car, have the surgical tubing wrapped around them, and the tubing wraps back around the makeshift foregrip that supports the flight groove where the dart rests and is accelerated by the surgical tubing. The weapon is not particularly elegant, and anyone could be mistaken for thinking that a glorified dart-flinging slingshot wouldn't be worth the time and effort to find the parts and to craft it, but that's where you would be wrong. The dart tips are covered in rad scorpion venom, and this is where the magic happens. 
the Venom will continue to do 8 damage for 8 seconds. Now that's not going to kill much of anything quickly, and indeed the critical damage is also very low at 12. However, the real kicker for this weapon is not the damage output, but the effect it has on the body, or really just the legs. Any shot on an enemy will do minus 1000 damage to the legs, crippling them and drastically slowing their speed. The poison effect is stackable, so more darts will equal more poison damage, but inorganic enemies such as robots are not affected by the poison. This weapon isn't meant to be a primary weapon, rather it's meant to augment combat by slowing down powerful melee enemies enough that you can put them down with other, more powerful weapons, or just run away. This is especially helpful when fighting death claws, who just beeline it straight for you and immediately start slicing you up. After they're shot, they won't be able to keep up with you at all. So let's look at the dart gun itself and its firing animations. The overall design is very close to a number of older paint gun designs. This Craftsman is the closest match I could find, and this product was sold in the 60s and 70s as far as I've been able to tell. Although all examples I found used compressed air connected to an attachment at the bottom of the hand grip, the Fallout 1 lacks any such attachment points, but has a very long rod in the back. This rod is used to cock and reset the elastics, so that it's ready to load another dart and fire. Perhaps this rod was originally intended as a sort of hand pump to pressurize air for the paint gun to paint properly. If you look at the paint gun's paint reservoir, there's a label that says bug juice with a skull and crossbones. This seems to imply that the rad scorpion venom is stored here and may hint to how the poison is applied to the dart. Nothing alludes to this in the lore, the firing or the reload animations, but it is probable that part of the firing process includes the paint gun nozzle spraying the dart with venom before releasing the surgical tubing. And this would mean that there is no need for a manual process for dipping or otherwise covering the darts with venom. It would be cool if, for an added effect, there was a little puffing sound to show that the darts get sprayed just before it's released. There are some interesting little details about this weapon, like the fact that at a small gun scale of 100, it is one of a few weapons that will have perfect accuracy. There is absolutely no spread. It is also treated as a silenced weapon, which makes sense since it's not very loud when fired. It doesn't matter where you hit the enemy, only the legs are ever affected. While we don't want to look a gift horse in the mouth here, what exactly about the venom makes the legs and only the legs vulnerable? This is doubly interesting because when you, the player, are hit by a rad scorpion, the only effect is to have 3 poison damage for 5 seconds, not nearly as much damage as from the dart gun, and there are no leg specific effects at all. Perhaps we can justify this by saying that the amount of venom injected by a rad scorpion attack is much less than what is slathered onto a dart, so the higher concentration of venom is doing more damage with extra effects. The weapon itself weighs half the weight of all the junk parts used to make it, which doesn't really make sense, so this is just a balancing decision. The light weight also makes it have the highest value to weight ratio of all the craftable weapons. Not bad for what is essentially a poor man's mini crossbow. Additionally, there is reference to a unique variant of the dart gun that was apparently supposed to be called the Phantom Darter, but it never made it into the game, and there are no game files referencing such a thing. Now I'm far from an expert in darts, but from my understanding, a 9 dart finish is considered a perfect game, because the player achieved 501 points and hit a double scoring area with the last dart. There is something referred to as a Phantom 9 dart, which is where you have a 10 dart game because one of the darts was a bounce, so either didn't stick to the board or fell out before the round was concluded. This would be the inspiration for the non-existent Phantom darter of Fallout 3. Fallout Tactics gives us a special opportunity in letting the player drive and fire a full-blown tank. The tank gun is therefore a usable weapon, and is considered a big gun, but was not covered in my previous videos for what I hope are pretty obvious reasons. The tank itself is some M4 Sherman variant, the shape of the turret, shape of the upper glacis, and apparent use of the 75mm cannon seem to allude to it being an M4A3, or maybe an M4A4, and the shells that are fired from the tank are high explosive shells, which would strengthen the argument for it being a 75mm. 
although the in-game renders of the game and the sprites don't really seem to agree on exactly how the barrel is supposed to look. The cannon does devastating amounts of damage, with base damage between 50 and 120, but this is balanced by the ammunition being very rare, and the tank itself requiring a considerable number of resources to keep in good condition. Since it is considered a long-range weapon, that means that there are aiming penalties for firing at close range, and a bug in the game will attribute the use of the cannon to the driver, and not the gunner who is actually the one operating the cannon. Fallout Tactics has a spear gun that fires a small spear or bolt with low damage. With base damage between 3 and 15, it is found in the first area on a raider, and the ammo is not all that common. It appears to fire from compressed air, as there is a large cylinder beneath the barrel, and it would only make sense to hold air for the operation of the weapon. It is otherwise difficult to make out many details, and I couldn't find any real-world inspiration for this design. Fallout Tactics has a brightly colored looking alien space gun. Just look at how futuristic this thing looks. Yeah, just kidding. It's a water gun. Or is it? It is in fact, not exactly a water gun either. This old super soaker looking gun has been modified to be filled with and shoot acid. Did I say super soaker? I meant to say supper soaker. In game it is called the S-U-P-P-E-R. Supper Soaker, and I'm not sure if that was intentional or not, or if I'm missing some sort of reference here. The label on the acid that is used as ammo implies that it is hydrochloric acid, which could definitely do some damage. According to the weapon description, the bright colors actually come from the ceramic shielding that was added in order to contain the acid. Doing a base range of damage of 5 to 25, it is considered an energy weapon, which is really stretching that definition but that's why it ended up here on this list. It can only fire twice before needing to be reloaded, but the ammo itself is quite scarce, so this is a difficult weapon to use for very long. And even though the acid has armor penetrating capabilities, the damage doesn't make this much more than a novelty weapon. It can only be found in one place, at the Canadian Invasion Special Encounter, which is an event where the player finds a group of people who, according to them, are protecting the border between Canada and the United States. Upon approaching the group, the leader will exclaim, We don't speak with your kind of Canadian scum. We invaded your country once, and we'll do it again. They will then commence attacking, and one of the characters will have the water gun and some acid. The group is referred to in-game as the Morons, which makes sense. The player is never even close to the border with Canada. They will yell a few other things, like, Go eat some back bacon. You think you're so good. And the one outlier, which is, I always wanted to be a lumberjack. All these guys are confused, but especially that last one. The Nuka World DLC for Fallout 4 gifted us another acid shooting weapon, the Acid Soaker. This is not a repurposed water gun. In fact, it's even more confusing than that. The gun itself is the Deliverer or a pistol just like it, which is interesting because the Deliverer is the only pistol in Fallout 4 that uses this model, so it is not a common weapon in the game at all. The front portion of a combat rifle has been removed and attached to the front of the Deliverer, and that's not even the weirdest part. A large bottle of acid sits upside down, supplying acid through some small hoses in a hole that once held the safety and delivers the acid to what I presume is an electrically powered compressor that pressurizes the acid so that it doesn't just dribble out of the barrel. The acid soaker does 10 damage, which is not impressive, but it has an added effect of reducing the damage resistance of the enemy for a short amount of time. This can be effective as an assist weapon that makes it easier for more powerful weapons to chew through enemies. It fires a unique ammo called acid concentrate and it is interesting that acid, which is commonly found as a junk item, is not used as the ammunition. The name would seem to imply that in order to be combat effective, the acid needs to be a bit stronger, and this is done by combining acid, glass, and adhesive. Killing an enemy with the acid soaker will result in them turning into a goo puddle, similar to what happens when an enemy is killed with a plasma weapon, but the goo doesn't glow. Just shooting a dead body with the acid soaker will also cause the dead body to dissolve into a goo puddle, which is kind of neat, 
and useless, which is one of my favorite combinations. You can get the Acid Soaker in the Nuka-Cade Prize Terminal for 6,250 Nuka-Cade tickets, but it's not always available there since the terminal stock will rotate through items. While this weapon has no mods, I find it interesting that rather than using some sort of pipe weapon to jimmy rig into an Acid Soaker, someone went through the trouble of refitting a super rare weapon, the Deliverer, with part of the barrel of another weapon, the Combat Rifle, and fitted an electrical compressor and hose system to fire through the barrel. The Acid Soaker is in Fallout 76 files, but as of the release of this video has not been implemented in game. Another Nuka World special is an actual water gun this time, known as the Thirst Zapper, which is a Nuka Cola themed water gun that pays homage to the 60s era ray gun aesthetic. This weapon is key in defeating Overboss Coulter at the beginning of the DLC, as he has some sort of crazy electric force field that protects him from all damage unless it is shorted by some water. Equipping the Thirst Zapper will drop 999 units of ammunition into the player's inventory that is inaccessible and invisible. Should you run out, unequipping and re-equipping the Thirst Zapper is enough to replenish all the ammo. How does this work? Well, I have an idea. Go watch some Man vs. Wild, or do a long road trip without taking any pit stops, and I think you'll get my drift. Although it won't do any damage in its base form when just shooting water, that won't stop people from becoming hostile if you squirt them. Chill out, it was just a prank, bro. Once the Soul Survivor finds the Project Cobalt schematics at Nuka World, it can officially be upgraded to something much more deadly, and can use a weaponized form of Nuka Cola that will do a base 57 damage. The next step up is the weaponized Cherry, which will do 172 base damage by causing a small explosion, and the daddy of them all, the Quantum, which will do 402 base damage. That is crazy powerful, almost as powerful as a fat man. How is this achieved? through the wonders of Fallout Willy Wonka science. You will have to craft the ammo as well, which will be weaponized Nuka-Cola ammo, or Cherry or Quantum variant, which requires a Nuka-Cola, Acid, Copper, Crystal, and Nuclear Material. I think it says a lot about Nuka-Cola in general, if adding these ingredients makes it turn into a massive explosive. The weaponized Nuka-Cola can't be mistaken for a normal one, since it is covered in duct tape and the word Boom! Scribbled on there with a pen, some large X's, and some mushroom clouds. The Soul Survivor uncaps the reservoir from the back and pours the Nuka Cola into it on reload, after which the Thirst Zapper will fire an entire Nuka Cola's worth of liquid in one shot. It is worth talking about how weird and quirky this weapon is for a moment though. First, when filling up the Zapper, the opening has a nice little bottle opener right there. Although the Soul Survivor is just an absolute maniac and flicks the bottle cap off with his thumb before dumping the contents in. Don't bother bringing it up to aim because there are no sights and the zapper will just block most of your view and actually make it harder to aim. Firing the weaponized Nuka Colas will result in a very slow moving bolt of energy that flies a pretty absurd distance. It honestly just looks very strange to watch it go and if you target something too far in VATS, Vats will sometimes leave the bullet time before the bolt even reaches the target. This weapon is also one of the buggiest I've used because at least once every 10 shots, the weaponized Nuka Cola won't appear when reloading. In Fallout 76, the Thirst Zapper made its appearance with the Nuka World On Tour update, looking exactly the same but with a few differences. The water ammunition is unlimited, and the gun defaults to shooting water until modified. Interestingly, although the base model doesn't do any damage, it uses the same damage table as the 10mm pistol, so if you the player have any damage boosting effects, it will actually cause it to do damage. It has the same modifications as in Fallout 4, and the weaponized Quantum once again does devastating damage. Interestingly, developers tried to get the Thirst Zapper to decrease the thirst of any player that was shot by it, but apparently couldn't get it to work right. One side note I find interesting is that another toy gun super similar to the Thirst Zapper can be seen advertised on billboards in the Commonwealth, and it's advertised as the Nuka Blaster, and that it comes with every box of Nuka Cola. 
The only difference seems to be that it's brown instead of red, so it is possible that these are totally separate toy products. Let's stretch the definition of a weapon a bit by looking at a few New Vegas items. The player can equip the detonator, which as far as the game is concerned is actually a weapon, so we're going to talk about it, if only for a bit. It is meant to remotely detonate any C4 that has been planted by the player, and can even be used to detonate a generator at the Hoover Dam. It cannot be used in any other way to attack enemies. But if you would like to use C4, this makes it a lot easier, since the only other way to detonate C4 is to shoot it, which is actually not how C4 can be triggered. Surprisingly, there are several variants. Loyal's detonator is used to trigger the inflatable ballasts to lift the crashed B-29 out of Lake Mead. The mining detonator is used to cause the Yao Guai cave to collapse in the Honest Hearts DLC. And there is a broken detonator at the Little Yang Tzu detention camp in Old World Blues. But this is just a miscellaneous world item and is unequipable. A much more advanced version of the detonator comes from the Lonesome Road add-on and is required in order to get past obstacles on the way to confront Ulysses. Again, this weapon does no physical damage itself, but it fires a visible laser that when trained on a nuclear warhead long enough, causes the warhead to detonate. What is interesting is that it appears to heat up the warheads as they start to glow and shoot small jets of flame until it explodes. This is interesting because the weapon itself does not do damage to anything else, but if it is heating up a metal warhead to the point that it starts to shoot flames, then that would definitely mess a person up. The warheads explode, but the fissile material in the warhead doesn't seem to actually undergo fission, because while the explosion is large, it's not nuclear warhead large. The weapon is very unique looking with lights and digital displays that rapidly change, and the overall shape is similar to the unique compliance regulator, so there's definitely some design inspiration there. The display and buttons might look familiar because they are the same exact readouts that can be seen on the red glare, which is also a Lonesome Road special. It doesn't need ammo and has the highest durability of any other weapon in the game, making it functionally invincible. Once you are done with the DLC, it doesn't serve any other purpose since it doesn't do damage, but it can ignite leaking gas, so that's better than nothing I guess. The games won't let you get rid of it even after the DLC though, since it is considered a quest item, and drawing it while inside a casino will cause people to panic like it is a legitimate weapon. The last of the weapons from New Vegas is the Big Mountain Transportal Ponder. Looking like a futuristic detonator with a glass bulb-like portion that emits blue light, using it in the Mojave will teleport the player to the Big MT, and using it at Big Mountain will transport the player to the Mojave Drive-In. There are a lot of caveats though. It will only work when outdoors, when the player is not falling or jumping, and the player cannot have any active companions. Some areas that look like they are outdoors, like Freeside, are not considered part of the Mojave Wasteland area, and so you cannot teleport from there. You also cannot teleport from other DLC locations. Although it is completely harmless, again, drawing it in a casino will aggro security. It's also a quest item and cannot be dropped, and it's only acquired by completing the main Old World Blues quest, where the Think Tank will give it to the courier as a token of thanks. New Vegas' H&H &H Tools Nail Gun, or Nailer, is a tool turned weapon that is unique to the game and introduced with the Lonesome Road add-on. As the name implies, it was created by H&H &H Tools, which came under the ownership of Mr. House's brother Anthony before the Great War. It is considered a semi-silenced weapon, and doesn't do great damage with only 9 base damage, but has an absolutely absurd fire rate of 14 rounds per second. It uses nails for ammo, I know, shocking, but has an interesting effect of doing double damage to limbs. It is unclear what powers the nail gun since the nails have no propellant and no energy source is ever shown or alluded to. It is interesting that it can't be found anywhere around New Vegas, even though we have an H&H &H factory right here in the city. It is a very industrial looking weapon, painted in yellow and black, and it loads nails from a drum-like magazine. This weapon is actually really fun to use because of the rate of fire, but I have to wonder, 
What were they thinking when they made a nail gun that shoots at such a rapid rate? Can you imagine trying to use this for anything other than combat? Hold the trigger for just one second and you've already driven 14 nails on top of each other into that 2x4 that you were just trying to nail in place. Fallout 3 introduced one of my favorite weapons, not necessarily because it's really powerful, but it is unique in its function and effects. The Railway Rifle is another craftable weapon in Fallout 3 and whose name I really hate saying. It is built from a crutch, a steam gauge assembly, a pressure cooker, and a fission battery. The fission battery seems to supply the energy to turn water into steam. The pressure cooker seems to hold the pressurized gas, and the steam gauge helps function as the receiver and barrel of the railway rifle. The only part I don't see implemented at all is the crutch, which I assume would have been fashioned into the stock, but that's not the case. It has a conventional stock that looks similar to the combat shotgun, but it's not quite exactly the same, and the lone wanderer just apparently pulls this part out of their butt when crafting the railway rifle. Aesthetically, it is a very interesting looking weapon. The trigger looks like a simple pull valve that releases the steam from the pressure vessel. There is a gauge at the end of the barrel that will only read max pressure right after a reload, dropping down as the player shoots. It isn't clear where the battery is stored and the function of the portion below the barrel that has a piston attached is not obvious based on the layout or the firing, reloading, or jamming animations in the game. The piston doesn't move, and the player does not use it like a grip of any kind. The underbarrel portion has a sort of mesh over an opening, and this may be where the train horn sound comes from, which is commonly heard while firing the rifle. The rifle does 30 base damage, which is respectable, and the only other combat details are that it has an effect that does times 3 damage to enemies' limbs, and on a critical hit, has a chance to pin whatever body part was dealt the death blow to the wall behind the target. This is definitely the most entertaining aspect of the weapon, and the good damage and limb bonus damage makes it quite capable. I didn't see this mentioned anywhere, but it can also pin loose body parts against walls. And if you hold the body part with the gun equipped, you can shoot it and have it stick exactly where you want it to. It's like you have a giant nail gun, so if you want to go full raider, just pin a bunch of severed body parts around your house like this. It fires railway spikes, which is a fairly common item, and does it pretty effectively, but the slow projectile speed can make it difficult to land shots at a distance. It can fire 222 times from full condition, which isn't great, but the components to make the rifle are fairly common, so keeping it repaired isn't too difficult. There are some interesting details of the rifle in Fallout 3 though. The spikes will not cause a splash or ripple in the water like a normal bullet, all the junk items to build one can be found in Ford Independence and Adams Air Force Base, so those can be your one-stop shop to the railway rifle. The reload animation shows the player only load one spike, although the rifle can be shot eight times per reload. Lastly, the concept art for this weapon is fantastic. Fallout 3's concept artists really have fun with this rifle. There are renditions where it is more like a heavy weapon that would be held like a minigun, even requiring a backpack. Some other designs show it as a shoulder-mounted weapon like the missile launcher, and his notes seem to imply that the weapon was at one time thought to be a pre-war tool for railroad construction that was reconfigured to become a weapon. The railway rifle only shows up in Fallout New Vegas as a non-playable mesh item that is displayed on the wall in the hidden weapon room in Mick and Ralph's. There is no other information related to where it came from, but given its rarity, then it is likely that Mick has it on display due to its uniqueness, after somehow coming across it. The railway rifle makes a comeback in Fallout 4, although it is in a different form. It is no longer crafted bottom-up by the player and can be found in several places in the Commonwealth. The railroad seems to really like the weapon, which is a bit on the nose, all things considered, and is sold by Tinker Tom and used by Desdemona. The rifle looks different than in Fallout 3 but it is still recognizable as the railway rifle, with a traditional stock, a pressure chamber, and barrel, with the same pressure gauge mounted on the end. Unlike in Fallout 3, railroad spikes are not as common as they once were, but they are quite cheap to buy and are carried by a number of merchants, although never in really large amounts. The weapon now does 100 damage, 
much more than before and still does additional damage to limbs with the body part pinning effect present as well. This drastic change in damage is for a number of reasons. The railroad seems to have an affinity for the weapon, and it would be a bit silly for them to opt for this weapon if it was really weak. It is also tied to the railroad in another way. Once the player completes the underground, undercover quest, which is a railroad main quest that is fairly far along, it will unlock the possibility to get legendary railway rifles from fallen legendary enemies. Making the rifle the symbolic weapon of choice for the railroad meant that it needed to be more capable, and due to the increased damage, it can only be found after level 20. The rifle can get a few upgrades, making it automatic, giving it a long barrel, a recoil managing stock, a number of sighting options, and a so-called bayonet, which is just a hole saw drill bit that is attached to the front. I mean, it looks cool, but unless that thing rotates, it won't be as effective as a good old sharp piece of metal. The underbarrel element that I suspected to be the train horn is now on top of the barrel, and although it looks a little different, you can still see that there's a piston and a mesh covered front portion. So I don't know guys, I'm really thinking that this is the train horn. Fallout 76 has the same railway rifle from Fallout 4 with some differences in how it works. The base damage is similar to Fallout 4 and there are a few more mods that increase damage and give more options. But most critically, it doesn't appear to have the limb damage multiplier or to actually nail body parts to the wall. But if I am wrong here, please correct me it is sometimes difficult to find solid information on certain aspects of Fallout 76. The weapon design appears to be pre-war in origin, as in Fallout 4 there is a bunker in Big John's salvage that was used by the Miller family who owned the junkyard to survive the bombs. The air circulation system wasn't working right and that caused the entry hatch to seal closed and since they were unable to turn off the generator for the air circulation system from inside, they were trapped and perished there. When the sole survivor opens the hatch over two centuries later, the railway rifle can be found in there, seemingly untouched from when it was used by the Miller family. Tinker Tom also has taken an interest in the weapon, modifying it and running tests that he chronicles in his terminal. You can see the heat radiating off the large main portion of the rifle, and steam can be seen escaping from seams or bleed valves from around the weapon. And because it wouldn't be complete without it, upon reload, the train horn will sound. You know, just to let your enemies know that you're ready for another round. The railway spikes are loaded in the top in a sort of hopper, and although the design looks very heavy and bulky, it is a very cool looking weapon. Fallout 4 introduced the artillery smoke grenade when aiding the Minutemen in their quests, and these grenades emit blue smoke when thrown. They don't just look pretty though. They mark the location that is meant to be bombarded by nearby artillery, and if a Minuteman artillery piece is within range, the effects can be devastating. The artillery must be within 5 grid squares, and if there's more than one artillery piece close by, they will join in on the fun as well. The artillery is remarkably accurate, given that their only indication is a smoke grenade, but the player can get information that their smoke grenade was seen by listening to Radio Freedom. I would have loved to have shown the devastating effects of artillery, but my game was completely bugged out and the artillery just wouldn't work. Not cool, Todd. Not cool. The grenades can be acquired after the quest Old Guns, where a yellow box in the castle's armory will hold 10 grenades that will be replenished with time. If a neutral or friendly NPC is hurt by the artillery barrage, then there is a good chance that they will aggro and start targeting the player character, even if it's purely by accident. The same grenades are available in Fallout 76 and are used in the exact same way. Only difference is that you need to have an artillery piece constructed at your camp, and if it's within range, then it can bombard enemies when the grenade is thrown. It does have a pretty long cooldown period though, so be aware of that. The grenade does not resemble any military smoke grenade that I can find, and is closer to commercial smoke grenades that are used for celebrations. There is a small easter egg on the grenade that says, a piece of flair, which is apparently a reference to office space where one of the characters is required to wear 15 pieces of flair at the restaurant where she works. Using the exact same model as the artillery smoke grenade, Fallout 4 has the Vertibird signal grenade, but this time it deploys a red smoke. 
They are first given to the player by Elder Maxon after completing the Show No Mercy quest, and the Brotherhood officially gives the player the ability to call in vertebrates. A vertebrate will come in, pick up the player, and take them to the destination designated by the player on their Pip-Boy. The player can man the minigun and shoot at enemies en route to the destination, and while in flight, the player can die, but the vertebrate cannot be destroyed. You know, it's nice to know that they send the one good vertebrate to the sole survivor. Should the player decide to side with the Minutemen or Railroad and destroy the Brotherhood of Steel, using the vertebrate signal grenades will bring a vertebrate from the faction that they ended the game with. So both the Railroad and the Minutemen gain the ability to use vertebrates after the main quest. There's really not much more to this weapon, although if you throw it directly at an NPC, you run the risk of it becoming hostile. Flares are thrown weapons that first debuted in Fallout and were also found in Fallout 2 and Fallout Tactics. Although they can do one damage when they are thrown and strike an enemy, and potentially a little bit more on a critical hit, the real benefit of these flares is to illuminate the enemy's position. This allows the player to overcome the darkness aiming penalty, so a well-placed flare can be worth the extra turn if it means landing your shots with your main weapon. Flares will stay lit as long as the player stays on the map that they were thrown on, and if you check the value of a lit flare versus an unlit flare, somehow they're worth more caps, although they can't be sold. Flares can also be a decent way to get caps in the early game since they sell for 35. So we talked about the flare, let's not forget about the flare gun. The flare gun first shows up in the Lonesome Road DLC, although it's been mentioned as a planned weapon in Van Buren, the cancelled Fallout 3. It can do some damage when fired at an enemy, with 10 for the initial strike, and another 1 damage for 10 seconds due to burns, but that's really not all that impressive. What does make it useful in the Lonesome Road DLC, however, is that it has the ability to frighten off so-called abomination-type creatures, like my ex-girlfriend. Other so-called abomination-type creatures are Deathclaws, Centaurs, Night Stalkers, and most crucially for the Lonesome Road DLC, Tunnelers. Also, apparently Mr. House is considered an abomination as well, so take that, Mr. House stands. The flare needs to hit the creature which will set it alight for some time, and they will panic, forgetting all about the player entirely, and give you around 10 seconds to fight or flee. There will be a notification in the corner that notifies you that the abomination panics and flees, so you know it works. Marked men can be found with flare guns and will use them as well, sometimes firing them in the air as if to signal to other marked men, and other times at creatures in the divide, which will cause the notification to appear on the player's screen. It also uses flamer fuel as the ammo type, rather than a dedicated flare ammo. The flare gun seems the most similar to the World War II era Italian model 1900 flare gun, just without the ring trigger. Fallout 4 is the next time we see the flare gun, and it is actually used as a signal this time. It can deal 10 damage, although there is no fire or burning damage, and it is given to the player by Preston Garvey after the first step quest. When fired, it can summon Minutemen to your location, although you have to be within 4 grid squares of an allied settlement. For best results, shoot toward the settlement you wish to get reinforcements from, since shooting away can sometimes not result in anyone coming. Three to six Minutemen will come to your aid, although they will almost always be low level and of questionable help. They will sometimes fire a flare in response to let you know that they saw your signal and are coming, but of course there is a delay as they must travel from the closest settlement. You're more likely to get good responses near the end of the game when the player can get reinforcements from all the settlements and manned checkpoints if you end the game with the Minutemen. This flare gun uses an actual flare ammo type, which is white with a red line and can be looted in multiple places or spawn along with artillery smoke grenades when sighting with the Minutemen. This flare gun is based on the design of the Walter flare gun from the 1920s and 30s as it is an almost direct copy. Fallout 76 also uses Fallout 4's flare gun, although there is no in-game use for it outside of notifying fellow players of your location or otherwise getting players' attention. It only does 5 damage now, and the flares can only be crafted or purchased at an ammo converter. Alright, that does it for this video. If your favorite quirky weapon didn't make the list, 
there will be another video where we round out all the difficult to define weapons, so just be patient. I want to thank my patrons here on screen now. I am really grateful for their patronage. They help me bring content at the pace that I do, and if you want to show extra appreciation and join their ranks, links are in the description. On to my comment highlights, starting with my cartography video about Commonwealth Supermutants. First off, I'm just glad so many of you find looking at the game from this perspective to be interesting, because I do too, which makes it so much more compelling to make these kinds of videos. A few of you brought this up and I think it's an important point to acknowledge. Most of the Radiant quests that require the player to go and take out a threatening group of raiders, mutants, or creatures will actually only require you to take out one specific target. So when I mention this in my video, it's important to realize that this isn't unique to super mutants. Some quests do require the entire group to be taken out, but those are in the minority and aren't usually radiant. So just be fallacious to try and infer anything about super mutants from this. Another comment by Sin, what a name, brought up a good point, that it is interesting that most intermutant conflicts don't devolve into the mutants killing one another. Rather, they will imprison any mutant who is deemed to be problematic. I think that is a very good observation, and combined with a host of comments like this from Cassandra, point to super mutants being focused less on the self, and instead the group as a whole. Strong talks of brothers sharing everything, and he doesn't like much, but he does like it when the soul survivor helps the Minutemen. I wonder if this is innate to super mutants, or if this is a byproduct of them understanding their precarious reproductive situation, where their inability to naturally propagate their race causes them to first think of the group before the self. Interesting thoughts guys, I knew I liked you. Brock's channel floated an idea that I hadn't considered when they posited that some Vault 87 mutants may have made it up from the capital wasteland to go to the commonwealth because there is talk amongst the Commonwealth super mutants of the green stuff, aka FEB. I think it is an interesting thought, and I have a few of my own. One, the mutants in the Commonwealth seem to be a different color, but maybe this was an aesthetic choice on the part of the developers rather than a real distinguishing feature. But if it is a deliberate choice, then Vault 87 mutants would be easy to pick out. Second, we don't actually know what they remember from their time in the Institute. The FEV lab certainly has quite a bit of green stuff, as it were, entire vats of it in fact. And who knows if they remember this green stuff being key in their transformation, and therefore, they seek it out. The super mutants in the Vim Pop Factory were specifically interested in the green liquids at the facility, and even though it isn't FEV, it was still worth it for them to settle down there. Lastly, I just want to talk generally in regards to some comments that talked about reading too much into the lore, finding meaning that isn't actually there. And there were even some people that said that there was zero meaning to any of it at all. There is at the very least some consideration regarding where we find what we do on the map. I specifically included that creature level map provided by Bethesda as a way to explain distribution from a game making perspective. Super mutants are not among the highest level enemies, and they don't show up in the highest level areas, so that proves that there is some consideration and some planning. Otherwise, I would expect a random distribution that didn't conform to any sort of meaning, like the leveling map, for instance. To the first point about finding meaning where there is none, that is a tale as old as time when it comes to art, and is frequently done in other media, especially literature. I'll come to some conclusions that weren't actually intentional by the devs, but in casting a wide net, we increased the chances of finding something meaningful that was purposeful on the part of the devs. I would rather cast too wide and uncover more hidden gems than to cast too short and come up with nothing. On to the VATS video where I ranked the different VATS systems across the series. This one got a little spicy, as I imagined it would, because anything opinion based is going to piss off someone somewhere. It's guaranteed. Kirstiv commented that how VATS works in 76 is how they believe all VATS systems work from a lore perspective, and I agree. 
I don't think it stops or slows time at all. And although it's possible that the user's perception of time is slowed, I also don't think it's that. I think all of that is just theatrics and is actually happening in real time. So Fallout 76 is probably the truest to how VATS looks to everyone else, except for the player. A few of you also reminded me that entering VATS in Fallout 4 while there are no targets is because of the VANS perk, which is supposed to illuminate the path to the primary mission objective. I had completely forgotten about VANS since I used it once right as Fallout 4 came out almost eight years ago, saw how unhelpful it actually was, and never wasted another point in it again. Thanks for the reminder. Bargain Fjorden mentioned that they hope VATS makes some sort of appearance in the Fallout TV show, and that is something that I hadn't even considered at this point. I really do wonder if they will, and if they did, exactly how it would be portrayed. I actually really like Vargan's idea of a character being just unbelievably good and quick with firing their weapon, and it's never actually fully explained except for a little hint that he's using VATS. That would be fun. Many comments didn't think I gave Fallout 76 a fair analysis, and I'm absolutely open to critique. The comment about not so many players using it was based on a super scientific and totally adequate sample size of the people I play with in 76, who mostly did not use it. And by looking in a few places online that discuss builds, didn't really talk about VATS or VATS related perks all that much. I am more than willing to admit that it's much more popular than I realized and stated in the video. There were also comments about how I didn't bring up the critical specific perks, and that's because I was trying to talk about the mechanics of VATS which up to Fallout 76, the critical system acted independently of VATS, but they did benefit from each other. Since 76 melds the two together, then it makes sense to cover all the critical perks, but then I'd feel like I'd have to do the same with all the other games, and I felt that my points would just get lost in the weeds when talking about criticals and not VATS. Like I said as well, I'm not afraid to change my mind on something when presented with new information, so this is a snapshot in time rather than some sort of universal Rad King truth. That said, as fans we need to better parse critique and hate because they aren't synonymous and I don't hate Fallout 76. I spend more time correcting people's takes on the game that didn't come from hands on experience with it, because a lot of people formed their opinion from the negative coverage that it has received. There are a number of people that I have convinced to try and play the game, several that I have helped in the early levels, and so on, because I think there is a lot to like about Fallout 76. Disliking a part of a game does not equate to disliking the entirety of it, and I have been accused of hating Fallout 4 because of my Syringer video, which is hilarious because it's my most played Fallout game, and some have also accused me of hating Fallout 3 because of my video about how the Capital Wasteland doesn't make sense with how it is in 2277. If we can't offer criticism for fear of being called a hater, then how can we point out problems or voice changes that we want to see in future games? Alright brothers and sisters, that will do it for this video. Bask in Adam's glow. Take care of yourselves, and I will see you soon.